Hello there and welcome everybody to St. Kevin Street Library, a library that opened its doors in 1904 and in this beautifully renovated building we are now celebrating One City One Book with Christine Dewar Hickey, an event that was meant to take place last April but you know the year that's in it. 2020 is a year like no other. A deadly virus, health risks of course, postponements, cancellations, disappointments. For Christine Dewar Hickey, novelist, short story writer, playwright, April 2020 was to be her one city, one book, a marvellous event to celebrate her 2004 novel, Tatty. And it couldn't happen then. But in June, her most recent novel, The Narrow Land, won two prestigious and lucrative awards, the Walter Scott Historical Fiction Prize and the Zurich Dorky Book of the Year or Novel of the Year Prize. So bad times, good times for Christine Dewar Hickey. And I am now delighted to welcome her to this event, a conversation about her writing life, a celebration of her work and Tatty in particular. And as a special treat, this conversation will be punctuated with four pieces of music special to Christine, music that plays a part as a part of her creative process. Christine Dewar Hickey, welcome to the, your One City, One Book. <laughs> and could I begin, please, by asking about your literary hinterland? You've cooked dinner for Liam O'Flaherty. You knew <laughs> Beham, you knew yeah. um, John Montague, Anthony Cronin, you knew Patrick Kavanagh, Leland Bardwell. Tell me about that whole world that you grew up in and your awareness of other Irish writers. Well, I mean, it seemed very normal, and I'm glad you say grew up, in, because it made me sound very old there for a while. You knew Brendan Bean, but um, I don't remember Bean, but he was the MC at my parents' wedding. And I do remember Liam O'Flaherty when I was maybe about 10 years of age, um, or maybe as old as 12, around that time anyway. Um, I, I met him several times, but in particular, um, there was one incident where uh, my father had the habit of coming home from the pub and bringing strays with him. And in this, on this particular occasion, Liam O'Flaherty and his American wife um, arrived home. And then my father would just dump whoever he brings home and go to bed. And he slept downstairs, so you could hear him snoring in the background. And before he went to bed, he would say, make something for our, our guests. So I had to make dinner for, come up with the dinner, which I consisted of sort of watery green peas and uh, half mashed potatoes, lumpy mashed potatoes, and whatever meat we'd had that earlier on for, for uh, maybe it was sausages, I can't remember exactly, but I do remember the pool of green. Did and she he, eat it? Oh, he ate it all, but she said, no, thank you, I'm watching my figure <laughs> <laughs> to me. But he was such, I couldn't stop looking at him, he was such an impressive looking man. There was a movie star quality to him, and those piercing blue eyes, and very handsome man. And he, he, he chatted to me and took me seriously and it was, you know, he was an interesting man. He lived to, I think, into his 80s and he had a rule that um, you could be a drinker, which he was, um, but you had to only drink every second day and on your day off, you walked 10 miles for the liver. And yeah. at that time in your life, Christine, were you a serious writer in the making? No, I, 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 I stopped any impulses that I had. I mean, I do think, when you look back, as always happens with these things, I do think that I was sort of born that way. When my, my parents had a very um, difficult marriage and there was a lot of rows and things like that. And when I was a little girl, I used to lie in bed at night and rewrite the day. I'd f make, the, make the day different. And I would somehow put myself in charge of the day so that, say, 
if I had gone to school with the proper socks on and I had my homework right and I had got, you know, got all my spellings right and this hadn't happened and that had happened, everything would change in the day and the end result would be that mammy and daddy wouldn't have a row. So I was used to that storyboard thinking from a very early age. So this is fictionalising your life. Fictionalising, yeah. That's but what when I did. you read Tatty, you realise yeah. that I presume you are Tatty. I am Tatty indeed, yes. But how difficult was it? I mean, if you look at your work, Christine, you had the Dublin trilogy, mm. it spanned decades. Mm. Then in 2004, in your 40s, you published Tatty. Mm. And Cheswaf Miwash, the poet, says, when a writer is born into a family, mm. the family is finished. Mm. How difficult was it for you to write so openly about a dysfunctional family, mm. a family in crisis, an extraordinary, intense experience within that home? It was very difficult to write and it's my shortest book but it probably took me the longest time to write it because I actually started to write it when I was in my 30s and then I'd stop and I'd leave it and I'd come back and I'd stop and um, I started as an exercise in therapy um, after my father died and I had been at that stage estranged from my mother for a couple of years and I just found everything was getting on top of me so somebody advised me to go and talk to a, a grieving counsellor about it. And um, she said to me after a couple of sessions, why don't you write the story down, but do it from a child's point of view. And you will see that children are not responsible for their parents' mistakes. So I did that and kind of into, going into it, then I realised, oh, this is not bad now. This might work as a novel. So I, as I said, I came and I went mm. and I came and I went. But what I decided to do was to deny that it was my story, to say there were autobiographical elements in it, but it wasn't my story. And that was what I stuck to at the time, which made it a little bit easier. You also use second person and third person, mm. which is a really interesting device. Mm. Because, you, I mean, in a way, Tatty sits between the early chapters of A Portrait of the Artist mm. and Roddy Doyle's Paddy Clark, Ha Ha Ha, mm. where you've got a child's consciousness jigsawing together the world and yeah. trying to make sense of it. But it's interesting that at the very end of Tatty, there's a very powerful moment when Tatty confronts her father and says, it is your fault, it is all your fault. Yeah, yeah. So the relationship between daddy's girl changes. Yeah. Was that true of your relationship? Yes, yeah, it was. I mean, it didn't last long. I still stayed a daddy's girl. I, my father was very difficult to stay angry with for long because he, you know, he would, he would tell you he was sorry and he was sort of, he had a very big heart, you know, so you wouldn't be angry with him for too long. And he also encouraged me, I think, to speak my mind, and he always had done. So I was very cheeky to him in lots of different ways, you know, particularly when I went into my teens. But yeah, it, it is very much, it is exactly what happened. The only really changes uh, in Tatty was that I felt, when I, as I was writing it, that from an author's point of view, it was too much responsibility to put on one child's shoulders. So I gave her a sister, Jeannie, who right. acts as a bouncing board in a way. Jeannie says th some things that she thinks really, you know, I used her to get into Tatty's mind and I changed the, the special needs child to a, to a girl. Right, right. Yeah. And um, it's a novel that's, a I mean, I think it's a brilliant novel and especially because less is more. Early on there's a sentence where you're watching men in a pub and they're pouring slanty bottles into slanty glasses. I mean, the yeah. observation is brilliant. But you begin with a christening and you um, move through, you know, confirmation, uh, family gatherings. Uh, Tatty pushes a child in a pram all the way to Kremlin. She uses money that was meant to buy meat at the butcher's and she does a binge sugar intake with a friend. Yeah. I mean, were all those moments yours or were they invented? They were mine. They were mine. Um, I went to a very big national school with about 40 kids in the class until I was 10. And I was very much lost within that, in that classroom. Um, I knew there was something different about our family. So it was difficult for me to make friends because every time someone would be friendly with me, I'd tell outrageous lies to kind of stop them from seeing what the real home life was like. So when I went to boarding school, that completely changed because I was the same as everybody else. And I loved boarding school for that, for that reason. I could be myself. But anyway, in the class, in the national school, I didn't do very well in school. And I, in that particular scene, I'm essentially trying to buy the friend. Yes. That's what I'm doing. I'm buying the friend. And I go and I get this, buy all these sweets for her. And I pretend I got the money from a, 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 a non-existent aunt in America. 
and mm -hmm. then she's murdered, which did happen to me. And very soon after that, mm -hmm. I went to boarding school. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and why were you the only one sent to boarding school? Because of that, I think, because of the difficult relationship with my mother. Right. And even yeah. then, you were treated harshly because you came third in the class and your father was cross. Oh, sure, my father was it fierce. It wasn't good enough. He was, he was dreadful, L third, you'd yeah. say. <laughs> but he was always like that. Right. Come back when you get yeah. first. Well, I'm well, only interested in winners. You know, talk about Joe Kennedy, this right. kind of carry on. He was on. a man for the races. <laughs> he was a man for yeah. the races, yeah. yeah. Um, Christine, um, your obviously words your life, but music also plays a hugely yes. important yeah. part. And you've chosen four different pieces mm. of music. Can you tell us about the Schubert and okay. how long that has been essential to your writing? Now, I can't remember where or how I came across that piece in the, in the, in the first place, but it's been part of my life for many years. And um, I think I started to listen to it maybe as far back as my first novel in 1995, The Dancer. And I listened to it anyway. I, I, I may have found it on a CD um, at home. We've loads of music CDs. I may have heard it, heard it on Lyric FM or something. But anyway, it became part of my life and I always have a CD with me wherever I go. And I listen to it in preparation when I'm trying to prepare myself for the long, rocky road ahead. Because writing a novel mm -hmm. is a very long, lonely business and it takes it out of you physically, mentally, mm -hmm. all sorts of ways. And um, this, to me helps me to get it into focus, the task ahead into focus. It's a compact piece of music, but it's also full of uh, imaginative flights of fancy, but they're all contained within the shape of this particular piece of music. And it also has, it's, it starts with a lot of energy. It's loads of voices. I hear, I hear loads of things in it like danger and um, pity and worry and love and all of that sort of things, but also regret. And regret, I think, is an emotion of the past. So there's backstories in that too. It belongs, regret belongs to the past. It's not a, an emotion for the future. And I also think that when it slows down, the little silences, there's a sort of ache in, the, in between the little mm -hmm. silences, tiny silences between notes. And all of that still remains of a very highly controlled piece of music, which is what it should be. And, you know, when we're talking about Tatty and the, 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 the races and the horses, when I was a little girl and I'd go to the races, the Phoenix Park races, if you were late, say, if you missed the first race, uh, you could sometimes be caught and the barrier would come down. On your way in, the barrier would come down and you would catch a fleeting glimpse of the horses who had just, that had just passed the winning post and they would fly past you. And you think it's the horse that has all the power because of the ability, the muscle, you know, and its natural mm -hmm. ability and the speed and the sound of the, 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 the hooves and everything. And, but really, it's the, it's the jockey that has control. And that's how writing a novel should be to me, I think. It should be fluid, it should move, there should be momentum, but the writer has to keep control. So that's why I like that. And in the version, we're now going to hear who's playing. It's the wonderful pianist, Lena Arcarney, and she plays it with great brio. Uh, there's, you know, people have their, bring their own personality to it, but there's a flamboyance in the way she plays it, and I really love it, and I, th I hope you enjoy it.
was Leonora Carney playing Schubert in the Hugh Lane Gallery. When you say that music is vital to your creative process, do you ever write and listen to music at the same time? No, it would be too distracting. But I carry the music around in my head. Now, that's, that's an overall one. That, that one is the Schubert piece is a given. That's always there. But for each of my novels, there's a sort of soundtrack that I pick. And that works in a way that it gives texture or it's something it gives, uh, like, and then the way a film would do, it, give, it brings something extra to the, brings a little bit of emotional sense to the, to, to the writing and um, to the story. And I, it also is something that I can associate with, my, with the novel so that when I'm away from the work, because I do think that we do some of our, much of our writing away from the desk you know, when you're going about your daily business. So if I choose to have a piece of music, uh, which I have associated with, 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 say, The Narrow Land, it was The, Pian the Planet Suite by um, Gustav Holtz. And every time I get into the car, I bang that on and I listen to it. I don't have to think about the novel. Something goes on in the back of my head. And if I'm in the kitchen, if I'm cooking dinner, you know, whatever I'm doing around the house, and I'm listening to it, I can still carry on in my life without being frantically worrying about the novel. And I'll find often that something, when I go back to the desk then, it's been worked out. So the, yeah. Holst, the movements in Holst becomes movements in the novel. Yeah. In that case, it became even more. It became, mm -hmm. I was at um, a concert in Montreal and, in, in, uh, and, and, and the, there was a very famous Japanese conductor who was supposed to be conducting it and he was ill and he couldn't. So a, a, sm a very small girl came on, she looked like a schoolgirl to me with a long ponytail and she was, she, as she was conducting with the ponytail, was going swish, swish and suddenly the movements, the different movements became the characters in The Narrow Land. I started thinking the bringer of war that's so like mm -hmm. Joe Hopper, always, uh, uh, you know, bracing for a fight, always bristling for a fight, ready to attack, um, all, could never sort of say uh, the right thing. She had to say what she thought all the time. And it was also Michael, the little German refugee, who had brought the war with him from Germany to America, mm. where he came to be, you know, an American boy to be adopted. But it was always going to be in his heart and in mm. his head. When yeah. you look at Tati now, is it the book that you wrote in terms of the original structure? Or what, did you rework it and to give us the book we have today? Tati, no. I, I, do you know what? I can't remember what I did. I just decided to do every year and it just once I made the decision I have a tendency to write a first chapter so many times but then once I make that decision I, I push through so once I got over the first chapter I sort of knew what I was going to do after that without thinking about it and how difficult was it to get the voice right because the voice is changes changes and gets older and yeah um, becomes more aware of things yeah. and more understanding of things. Well, I did different things. I mean, if that's the, the, the device, the novelistic thing. How do you make the, the child? I did different things. I watched children. I watched my own children. I have, because I think I lived so much of my own childhood on red alert, if you like, I'm, I have a really, really vivid memory of childhood. And um, I have great recall from my childhood years. And um, I brought that to play. I even, that right. even little details like when mm. the teacher says te a colour and the pupils put their heads in the desk and you tell us that the sounds were the traffic outside and the teacher having a sneaky cigarette. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the teacher in school a having a cigarette. But you see, a lot of the things you, that are in Tati, people think, oh, that's awful. But then they didn't seem to, that bad. You know, I mean, bringing, say, the, the milk to school for lunch. In the baby In the baby power, power bottle. bottle, in the whiskey bottle. That didn't really, I don't think that seemed that outrageous. Mm. Or sending a five-year-old, now when you think of it, it's dreadful. And it probably was mm. dreadful, really. Sending the five-year-old over to the bookies in, in Castle Knock with the list and make sure you look left and look right and going across mm. with the... You know, that did happen all the time. You'd be sent mm. out to the bookies. There's one gloriously yeah. happy moment in Tashi, and that's when the nun brings the girls to see the trees in the Phoenix Park. But otherwise, it's very dark. It can be very disturbing. Yeah. What was your reader's response? Well, they're different all over, you know, all over the world, I think. Um, Did you have a global response? Yeah, to well, in, it's translated into Italian, for example. And if you go to an Italian reading, they just weep their way through it. So you're thinking, oh, my God, I can't do this. I just can't do it. They just weep. 
But in Ireland, they laugh because there's, there are funny elements. There, they tend, people tend mm -hmm. to laugh in Ireland. Um, it's translated into Arabic as well. And I don't know, I'd love to know what they make of it, actually. Mm -hmm. I haven't been to any of the things. But when Tidy came out in the beginning, I got a lot of letters. They used to be letters. And I felt I was in danger of sort of being the spokesperson for alcoholic adult children of um, alcoholics. And now, again, I'm getting emails this time, of course, from people who've read it and younger people. So it's a problem that's ongoing, of course. But um, I still am always very happy when somebody tells me that it works as a novel because that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a novel. Um, in the closing pages, Jeannie says, I know one thing, I will never drink because she's witnessed an alcoholic yeah. household. Was that true of you and your siblings? Um, when we were kids, I don't know, I, I couldn't speak for my siblings really. But yeah, when I was a child, I hated drink. I got over that now, I have to say, when I was, when I was young, young um, and about town. But um, I don't drink now, but I don't think it's anything mm -hmm. to do, it's really got to do with the fact that I have one kidney and I can't, you know, I get a massive hangover for half a glass of wine, it's not worth mm -hmm. it. And I just, and I don't really drink now. Uh, but I don't drink at all now, and I haven't done for about five years, I'd say. I think I could probably have a drink again, but it mends something inside me not to drink. Mm. It actually mends. It, it does something to the past. You've chosen a piece to read from the mm. novel, and this is about the father. Obviously, the father is a very powerful presence in the book, but as is the mother when she goes and confronts the teacher yes. about her special needs child. But yeah. let's just hear this moment, which is about father and Deirdre. Yeah, the, the Deirdre is a special, special child and holy God sent to us because he loves us so much and he knows we look after the special child. But it shows something of the difficulties and the challenges that the couple had, you know, the, the pressure they were under. So there's a little description of her. She's too tall for her age, but she doesn't know how to walk until dad chose her. She wore nappies until she was nearly five, and mam had to make the nappies herself out of toweling stuff you buy in Arnott's because her bum was too big for the nappies you buy for little babies. Everyone says it's an awful pity about Deirdre because she has such a beautiful face. Then they say mam is a saint. Nobody ever says dad is a saint, even though he was the one who got her out of nappies and he was the one who showed her how to walk and then showed her how to turn all the funny noises she makes into words. He stands at the far wall and says, are you ready? He goes down on his hunkers and says, are you steady? He puts his arms out to her and goes, are you ready? Are you steady? Look into my eyes, only into my eyes. One, two, three, and charge, Deirdre, charge. And she looks like she's swimming in the cold, cold sea with her arms flapping all over the place, feet going too fast for her body, blinky eyes popping out of her head, breath all sharp and afraid. The first time she ever walks without falling, Mam starts crying. Dad pats Deirdre on the head and says, there's my good girl, my good brave girl. And his eyes are all sad and damp when they should be happy and dry. My good girl, my good brave girl. Then he makes her do it again. When Deirdre hears Dad's car coming, she crawls into her top secret place behind the sofa. But he always finds her and makes her practice and practice and practice until one day she gets it right. The first word she ever said was the bold F off. Dad didn't teach her the bold F off on purpose. She just picked it up by herself. She couldn't really say it properly, but you could still tell what she meant by the way she put all the sounds together and by the cross little face on her when she pushed the sounds out of her mouth. F oh. If you said a bad word, Dad would give out to you. He'd say, where did you hear that dirty, filthy word? And then you'd have to say, I don't know, Dad, even though you know you heard it off him in the car. But when Deirdre said the big F off, Dad didn't give out to her. Dad gave her a hug and a big swing up to the ceiling. It's a beautiful moment. And even though this is auto-fiction, so it's very close to your own um, story, um, you don't, the reader, I think, doesn't end up blaming anyone. It's just one sorry, yeah. unhappy situation. Yes, I think, um, well, I think it's the novelist, it's not the novelist, uh, the job of the novelist to, blame, to, to apportion blame. We have to look at all sides. And like a camera, like that camera over there, you're looking at everything. Mm -hmm. And maybe you go into one head, the camera goes into one mind and then it goes into the other. And that's how I write anyway. 
and then it goes into another. But you don't make judgments. You try not to make judgments. You look at each side of the story because in a situation like this, nobody's to blame, really. Although people do blame themselves, mm -hmm. particularly the children. But, and yeah. the novel takes place in the so-called swimming, uh, the swinging 60s in Holy Catholic yeah. Ireland. Yeah. Um, religion in the novel plays a kind of an absent role, really. There are christenings and confirmations, yeah, but ab absent, the yeah. church is absent. Well, it was absent from my life. We never really had. I learned about God and the, the vengeance of God uh, from my aunts on, uh, in Drumcondra, you know, around that, uh, oh, that area where my mother was from. And I used to spend a lot of time in different people's houses because I was an only girl and because the brother next to me had, had special needs. So you couldn't really play with them. And there were no other kids around. So anyway, I used to go to the ants and the ants would you send you to things, you know. And I remember my, my um, lovely aunt Sadie telling me one time when she was trying to cure me of telling lies. You know, every time you tell a lie, you hurt our saviour. And I said, who? <laughs> and she, she uh, and I used to be terrified of, you know, the fellow with the, with the, the heart on fire. And I, she would try to educate me about religion because they sort of knew that my father was a hopeless case, a man who could barely say, um, the Our Father at his own wedding, for God's sake. You know, they just were very much against that carry on. And when I would go home to my father and I'd say, Auntie Sadie said this, Auntie Peggy said this, one of the aunties said this, he would say, I don't mind that old shite, he'd say to me, you know, and that was it. Were the aunts in real life as interesting as the aunts in the novel? Oh, yeah, they were. They were very interesting. Aunt they? Sal, glamorous. Oh, Aunt Excel Sal, hostess. yeah. There wasn't really an Aunt Sal. There was a pal that was more like right. Aunt Sal. No, my aunts were, you know, when they came, they came in the gang and they came with their handbags. And they were very much against mm -hmm. um, my father, you know, particularly as my mother started to, the drink was clearly a problem because they weren't interested in sort of how to help, but rather who to blame. It's brilliant on the differences between men and women, yeah. even the way the men and women eat sandwiches <laughs> in the early pages, yeah. that you're very good on looking at how women interact and support each other and yeah. talk openly about um, the awfulness of men yeah. and how men just talk about races or... Yeah, they, they, they don't talk about the women they at don't, all. They don't talk about feelings, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, you've, the next piece of music, Christine, is very specific to Tatty, isn't is, that yeah. right? And tell us about it. Well, this is my, my husband writes music and um, he was writing this piece of music for the trumpet when uh, I was writing Tatty. And it just sort of soaked into my head and uh, while I was writing it. And the trumpet is very interesting. I've picked two trumpet pieces. It's a very interesting um, instrument, I think. It's the, most, it's the instrument that I think is most like the human voice. And there's something masculine about it. And there's something um, very strong about it in some ways. But there's this uh, almost determined masculinity that, you, uh, that makes me think of a soldier. You know the way soldiers would have it. Would they go mm. over the top knowing they're going to be killed, but they'd still do it. They'd still go for it. And almost like the father in Tatty, and like my own father was. He could see he was going to his doom, but he'd go anyway with this, with this sort of masculine determination. And um, at the same time, in this particular piece, the writing is quite delicate and vulnerable. And I love that about it. And it makes me think of a child, in other words, Tatty, standing alone in a field, or maybe in a, maybe in a car park, or maybe in a desert, an empty race course. And I still kind of get emotional when I hear this piece of music. Uh, it's written by Dennis Hickey and it's called Lament and it's played by Colm Bourne. <laughs>
And that lament on trumpet was played by Colin Byrne and it was in the Hugh Lane Gallery. Um, Christine, you are a very established and um, widely recognised author now, but you skipped university. Yes. Fam Did you escape university? Or? No, I just, I intended to go. I did always intend to go. Um, and um, I always wanted to go to do English in Trinity. And um, that was it. I had this bride's head revisited the thing going on and I just thought um, Trinity was the nearest. So we had to bride's head. And um, a few different things happened. You know, there was the problems at home. Um, I, when I was in fifth year, I got viral pneumonia and I had to go to Cherry Orchard for three months. I was in quarantine for three months where I learned to read and I learned to read as, a, you know, as an adult reader and to really see what books were about and to live inside my own head. And then, you know, by the time I came back out, my parents' marriage was, was, was gone. You know, he just was gone and my mother had left the house and, you know. Anyway, everything sort of went, there was, everything went to hell after that. And did the fallout affect the other children? I think so. I'm very reluctant. Oh, of course it did, yeah. It always yeah. affects the children. It affects everybody. And I think that just we lived in a very chaotic time. My father was the principal carer at this point. And he had been for quite some time, but this was more official. And um, my mother was in St. Pat's getting treatment and that sort of thing. And she had her own struggle and whatever. And um, then I sort of thought that I would go and travel for a bit and then come back and go to college. But it just didn't happen. Just and didn't what happen. were you reading during that time? In, 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 in your own reading life? In, when, when, when I was in um, the Cherry Orchard, say, I always had a stack of books. F. Scott Fitzgerald, I adored F. Scott Fitzgerald, loved F. F. Scott Fitzgerald. And I just read, I read so many things. I read a lot of books that were at home, you know, um, a lot of American writers, and I read a lot of um, Evelyn Waugh and all that kind of thing. And Joyce, of course, I discovered... When I was about 18, 17 or 18, I discovered Joyce. Um, I had read Dubliners, we'd, we'd done Dubliners, but I discovered Ulysses and T.S. Eliot. And I mm. found it very hard, I have to say, to, and I sometimes wonder about the wisdom of putting um, T.S. Eliot on the leaving cert, because it's very hard once you, once you study that first to settle down to other things, you know. It just seems so cool and so wonderful, mm. you know, which it is. Mm. And so I would read read something, maybe in school, like say, The Love Song of Alfred J. And then I would go off on my own little tangent and not pay any attention to what was going on and, and read all about, as much as I could about, of T.S. Eliot and read as much as I could about him and about his poetry. And then the same with Joyce. I, I just discovered Ulysses and I was just a goner. And did you explore words and language as Tatty does when she's asked to find synonyms and yeah. she writes a very private note to herself on the word drunk, but yeah. then she hands the teacher up a variation on the word cold. Was yeah. that something you did? I did do that, yeah, all the words for drunk, because you'd hear them all the time, you know. And my It's quite a list. It's quite a list, yeah, it's quite a list. Mm. And, um, you know, you'd hear other people, because in those days in Ireland, unless you were falling around the place, you weren't an alcoholic, it, it was kind of, they'd look down, really heavy drinkers would look down their nose at people. Who, who couldn't hold a drink and think they'd no problem at all, even though they were drinking mm -hmm. rings around themselves. And, um, you know, I, I would have heard all those things. I, I went to so many pubs, you know. You, you know that poster of the pubs? Yes. Well, I was looking at that one time and I was sort of saying, N -n -n -n. and I knew every one of them, I'd say, before I was five, <laughs> all the old pubs that were, mm. you know. And Christine, um, when you began then to publish, mm. what was your first foray into... Oh, print yeah. on a page. Well, I avoided it for years. As I said to you, I was looking at people who were writers and I thought, I don't want this life. You know, I want something more organised. And I avoided it. But um, I had fallen, I'd fallen off a horse. This always sounds, me, makes me sound like a real, you know. But anyway, I had an accident and fell and broke my collarbone. And I was trussed up. Mm -hmm. which, and that was when I started to write. Like when I couldn't physically write, I couldn't type or anything. But I, I started to write, I said, you're going to be 30 soon. I just give it a year and just try and try, try to do it. And was that and a short work, story or a Short novel? story. So I bought two big foods cap copies and I'd write like this with the sling. I'd write, my shoulders still gammy from it. And I'd write like this for half an hour. My, I had my kids very young. So, you know, like the, they were in school. They were all in school mm -hmm. and everything before I was 30. So I could write, I'd write like that for about half an hour. And then the next day I'd pick up the other food's cap copy, and I'd write like that, looking at what I did the day before, and change, and delete, and cross off, and change. 
And I still, in a way, write like that. I delete, I, I edit as I go along. But the first story, awful rubbish. The second story, God, you wouldn't, you'd die rather than let anybody see it. We're getting worse rather than Were better. you the judge of that? I was Did you judge. ask other people? No, I, I, was, I was a judge. I kept, keep it private. Then I got to the fifth story and I just decided to write a story that was about a little girl going to the races with her father, which I had done so many times. And I put myself into the mind of the child and I closed my eyes and I visualized the, the, the map of the Phoenix Park races. And I took her from the entrance where the, where the dealers, you know, mm. who were people who sold fruit then, there's something else now, from the prams. All, they'd all know my father, they'd be talking to and everything. The dealers, the noises, the sounds, everything she heard, her, you know, being pulled up, he'd, he'd lift her over the turnstile so he wouldn't have to pay for it. The clean sandals going in, going into the ladies, looking at the women, putting the makeup on, and you know, look, look being a child wandering around, the art time boys, all that, I did it. And I knew in the second paragraph that I had something. I kind of knew I had something. And I entered it into the stole, Writers Week. And um, they, uh, I got a phone call to say I'd won. But sure, I rang my poor husband and he thought someone had died. I was sobbing on the phone. I was just... Because suddenly it meant that you I were was a worth, well, I, that I was worth something or something. I don't know what it did to and me. And what was the name of that story? A, a, a terrible title, actually. Across the Excellent Grass, it was called. Because the, she thinks the grass is excellent, you know, that because it's so perfect, the, gra the, the grass in the race course. And, um, I, and he kept saying, who is it? Who is it? Who? Just tell me, calm down, who is it? And I was trying to tell him. And then I went over to see mm. my father to tell him. Um, we couldn't look at each other, because he, he, he always wanted to be a writer. He was just bursting with pride, you know. And um, he, the tears came into his eyes. So he said, um, well, we're going to have a drink, because that's all. You know, you just bring him for a drink. So I brought him down the road then to, to the local pub for a drink. So he was delighted with it. But um, that was my main thing. And I, I think no matter what happened after the, this, right. no matter what I want, nothing will give me that same thrill. And the two short story collections, the eight novels, mm. does it get easier? It does to some extent in that you learn your craft, um, but it takes it out of you physically, I think. It takes it out mm. of me mm. um, f physically. Well, Actually, you know, that you, you get up and you're kind of going, you know, it's your hands mm. are, I, I get so intense when mm. I'm writing. What's your third piece of music? My third piece of music, we're going back to the trumpet, is for the work in progress, the novel that I'm trying to work on now. And this is set in the 1970s and in the present time, or was supposed to be in the present time. I don't know what does that mean anymore, because I may have to change things in that, because it is really about people who go to London and they go, you know, full of hope in the 70s and what happens to them. And the, this trumpet piece here is the failed boxer who goes full of, you know, physical, he's physically at, at his peak and he's mentally at, at his peak and everything looks as if it's going to happen for him. And, um, and it doesn't. And he ends up squatting in the uh, now derelict boxing club where he used to train. And he goes on walkabouts. He loves nature and he goes wandering outside of London and he's, he's sometimes in prison for being drunk and disorderly and all that kind of thing. And he has a brother who's a trumpet player. And even though the brother is a trumpet player, this piece belongs to the boxer. And he appears to have done very well, plays in the orchestra and all that, but his life is just as much of a mess. And the third girl person is a barmaid who goes over when she's 16. And she, in a way, is squatting as well in a, in a pub that's closed down. And the piece is by Telemann. I think it's, um, it shows that loneliness and, again, that masculine quality. And it's uh, from the, his trumpet concerto, concerto. I'll use it all, but this is the first movement.
And that was Colin Byrne with the Telemann Trumpet Concerto First Movement, again played in the beautiful Hugh Lane Gallery. Um, we've also some questions from cyberspace. Okay. We're being very sophisticated <laughs> here. Because we haven't got a live audience, okay. we've invited people to email questions in. Okay. So they've come to us via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So Kevin Doyle asks you, what's the best writing advice anyone has given you? I'm not sure I was ever really given um, much writing advice. I kind of worked it out for myself. Um, I do remember, though, Anthony Cronin saying to me once, you know, every word doesn't have to be a work of art, doesn't have to be dazzling and brilliant. You blind yourself. He said, keep it, you know, you can also keep it plain. And that way, you know, you can, you can have some play, you'll show up the, the good stuff. So that was the only one I can actually remember having. Um, Myself, my own writing advice that I would give to somebody starting out would be uh, read like a writer and not like a reader. And that way you see the change in tempo. You see, I think it's very important to listen to your novel, you know, mm. to listen to your work. A change in tempo. You see how a writer goes from A to D without having to take it through B, C, E and F, all those kind of things. When to introduce a character. Mm. And it gets you used to the, to the craft of it. I think that's, Paul Muldoon always said that in schools, we're never taught how to read, meaning yeah. that attention to detail, yeah. the nuance, the structure, yeah. the choice of word, etc. Yeah. Here's another question from Saoirse Anton. What or who has been the biggest influence on you as a writer? I'd have to split that prize, like the Booker Prize, split oh. it between James Joyce and Virginia Woolf. And I think it's because, on two characters I'll pick, Leopold Bloom and Mrs. Dalloway. And again, it's going back to that idea of the camera in the head, only seeing what the character sees, only hearing what the character hears, lowering them down into the location, which should be a character too, you should know it so well, and letting them move and then see what happens. And uh, they've always, every one of my characters, I still do that with. Lorraine Lou wants to know, what's your favorite, well, what is your favorite place to write and why? I can write anywhere. You know, I think it's a very, it's a very, um, and it's something peculiar to male writers, I think you often hear, oh, I have a den and I, nobody can come near me and I have to go here and I have to go there. And, you know, I mean, I like, I spend time in Italy. Well, I used to spend time in Italy. We don't know when we'll be going back again. And I like to write about Ireland when I'm there, funnily enough, at the distance. And what's good about being there is um, that I can't, I'm not available to do anything else because I like to immerse myself completely in a novel. I have to mm -hmm. become part of the world of the novel. And uh, so there's no distractions. But I also have two places I write at home. One room, if I want, it's, which is quite big and bright, if I want to open things out. But if I want to come back in, I go into the dark little room. Or I have to say, if my husband keeps talking, I go into the dark little room upstairs uh, to hone in on things. And when I, if I complain about not having the right space, I always think of poor Joyce with his big magnifying glass hunched over. A, a, a bed in a cheap hotel that in, a, in the one room that he would share with his wife and two kids and you think well you know get on with it just write what mm -hmm. you're lucky to be able to do it at all all yeah. your work is very much preoccupied with time and mm -hmm. history and place and the final question via facebook this time mm -hmm. from jamie dillon he wants to know how do you research the physical, social worlds that your characters inhabit? Do you, how do you write about them so well? I mean, is it history books or whatever? I, I love the newspapers and I like to read the newspapers um, as they would have been read, you know, like that. If you can, if you can get the old newspapers, they're, they're more rare now. And I like to um, look at the letters to the editor to see what people are complaining about. I like to look at the old maps. Old maps are great because they usually name places. You know, they say mm. the orphanage was here or the glue factory was there. So you can then imagine Tom's directory. So that's something else I do. Uh, for the narrow land, I did read some history books, but it depends. You can get bogged down in detail too much because what I'm interested in is ordinary lives going on uh, in the middle of while big historic events go on mm. around them. You know, um, I did read Anthony Beaver's uh, Berlin, which changed the whole tenor of the thing. It's a, it's a wonderful book because it's almost right, like reading a novel. It's very real. He, he makes it very mm. real. It's very immediate. So I, do, I kind of do all those kind of sort of things. And I imagine my way into the past. Again, in the narrow land, I imagine my way into the pictures. Went to Cape Cod twice, rented a house on the same beach as Edward Hopper, 
went to his house, uh, the house, the summer house, and walked around and imagined my way into it. So you have to do whatever you can to, to imagine your way into the person and into the past. And your locations, I mean, you're very much a Dublin writer in many yeah. ways, but then Last Train from Liguria brings us to Italy. Yeah. Uh, we're on Cape Cod in the narrow land. Um, were you surprised when you discovered you were writing The Narrow Land, a novel set in Berlin and in, the, um, in Massachusetts? Yeah, um, I was actually, I was quite surprised. That's the way it happens sometimes. Um, I had the boy first and I had Berlin in my head. I knew he was a child that was lost, just wandering around uh, shortly after the war, suffering from malnutrition, picked up by the Red Cross and put into a, um, a, a kind of a camp hoping that somebody would claim him, which they didn't. And I had him, but once, once I, I was in Boston, I went to visit uh, Cape Cod, and once I saw the landscape, and the light in particular, and the um, otherworldly atmosphere, it's a very, very remote area in Cape Cod, miles, it seems like miles away from the Kennedys, uh, Cape mm -hmm. Cod. And, um, and I just knew that was going to be part of it, so I took it from there went back later then to do research And of on course, it. Michael in the Narrow Land isn't a million miles away from Tatty in Ireland. Two troubled childhoods yes. trying to piece together both um, experienced liars as a defence mechanism, yes. as a way of surviving. Yeah. So there are things there that we can... The, when they write the PhD theses on you, they'll oh. be talking about yeah. you know, cer certain continuums in the work of Christine Dwyer Hickey. What about um, Alec as well in The Last Train from Liguria? He's a child, he's a half Jewish child who's autistic. You're not going to write the thesis, you're going to write more novels. Yeah, I just remembered that there's another one. There's another one, no, I will never write that. Uh, mm. There's another, there are children and there's often disabled children somehow. They're disabled in, it, in, in my work too, mm. I think. Yeah, and did your immediate family um, love Tati, your siblings? I don't know, I think they found it. I think they found it, I don't know if they all read it. Uh, my mother certainly wouldn't read it, she refused to read it. Uh, even though my brother said to her, you should read it because, you know... And you, you were estranged from your mother for a very long for time? For 20 years. My goodness. I know, yeah. She only died a few months ago. Was, I saw her just before she died. She sent for me, but it was very strange. Uh, very, And this whole thing with One City, One Book, it's, it's been a huge blessing, but it's been a very mixed blessing in some ways. And know? did she know about your um, celebration, your I don't know, she book? didn't acknowledge anything like that. And I just saw her in hospital. I mean, she was, she was um, sitting up in the bed and very, uh, very alert and very, still very formidable. I was always a little bit afraid of her, to be honest. In Tati, she was uh, very glamorous. She was very glamorous when she was young, yeah. yeah. She was very glamorous and um, used to sing, a great singer, jazz singer. And what did and she say to you in her final days? She didn't you? say anything. She really was really more pleased, I think, to see my daughter, my youngest girl. She asked for the two of us to come to see her. And she just kind of kept talking about the past a bit, but she didn't really, you know... She said one funny thing. She said to me, oh, you were very, always a very good girl. You were a very good girl when you went, and you went away to school and you loved your school. And, and that was the first time I ever... I remember hearing her saying I was a good girl, but mm. she just kind of kept talking. She looked very strong, like she had a big head of hair in her. And she, the only thing that had changed really was her eyes had changed colour. They were pale where they used to be dark. And it was like seeing an aunt that had gone to Australia when I was about five or something. And I was only seeing her again because I felt I had done my grieving for my mother a long time ago. So At times she, when you need your mother during your life, you know. So she didn't see Christine Dwyer Hickey write her. She saw Christine Dwyer Hickey, Christine a little Dwyer. girl who was very good, who was very and good. now a and grown yeah. up woman with children of her own. And she just, she really was, was interested in my youngest daughter. She loved, yeah. always, she was always her pet. Um, and I have to say that I never denied, I always tried to encourage the kids to see her, but it's just, I don't know, it's just one of those sad things. A fractured family from alcohol, it does terrible damage. And it's very, very hard to come out of it, you know, to mend it, really is. But you must have been glad for the opportunity to see her. I think she, what she did was a noble thing. I don't know if she necessarily wanted to see me, but she knew it would make the process much easier. It would make mm. the funeral a lot easier. I mean, I would see all these people who were in Tatty, well, the aunties were gone, she was the last to go. People I hadn't seen, cousins and things I hadn't seen for years and years because it was one of those breakups. My parents couldn't be in the same room. Like, even on my wedding day, there was, you know, one group of friends had to mine my mother in one corner and my father in the other corner. They couldn't, mm -hmm. they, they just couldn't be in the same room. Um, and the two families, I all these people who were part of my life when I was growing up, 
they just suddenly just stopped, mm. you know. It's difficult being a writer, isn't it? You're giving away all the time. You're giving away all the time and you're digging deep all the time. And Tati, I don't think I will ever write another autobiographical book. Mm. I think it'll all, I mean, the first three in a way were a way of trying to understand my father's family. Um, they were a very troubled but talented family and I was kind of interested in them. And Tati followed on from that. But I don't think I will ever, somebody I think mm. asked a question about whether it, would it be a, a folly or upper. I don't mm. think I don't think I would do it. I think um, it's enough, you know. And our final piece of music, Christine. Our final piece of music is a piece, a, a traditional piece of music. Um, it's called the um, the the Fairy Boy, and it goes in like a, many traditional Irish pieces. They start off with a slow lament, and then it goes into the fairy's hornpipe, which is a more joyful. Uh, it ends on an upbeat note, and it's played by my brother Donica. Now, Donica used to live with us um, as my parents were separated when I, we were a young couple and our children were small. He lived with us and um, in a, our house in Chapel Isard and he wanted to play the pipes. He wanted to learn how to play the pipes. Now, we lived in an old house that was about three foot thick, which is just as well if you've ever heard anyone trying to learn how to play the pipes. It makes some racket. So he was upstairs making a fierce racket, but I was downstairs learning how to be a writer with all sorts of bang, bang and wallop going on in my own head, you know. Now, Donica, I'm very glad to say, went on to be um, a, a very well-respected and, as we shall hear, a very fine Ilham Piper indeed. And he actually makes Ilham Pipes for a living and they go all over the world. And I love bragging about him. He's a wonderful musician. And um, I'm delighted that we're going to finish on his, on, on his playing. Well, we end on two high notes. Yeah. The high note of your being One City, One Book 2020 <laughs> and you. your brother playing the Ilham Pipes. Christine Duarhickey, thank you very much. Thank you, Niall. Thank you very much. <laughs>